I was praying for healing and I heard a woman's voice go to the Catholic Church. So I literally drove to a Catholic Church, opened the door, I walk into the cavernous, empty Catholic Church, I sit down in the pew and go, well, I'm here. This is Touched by Heaven. Everyday encounters with God, those moments when heaven and earth collide and we see God. We see his hand reaching out to us, attempting to get our attention, inviting us into a closer relationship. Here we share stories of encounter with angels, divine intervention, prophetic dreams, visions, near-death experiences, big and little God incidents. I'm your host, Trapper Jack. Welcome. This would be episode 174. You know that saying uh, you'll hear often is, uh, God will meet you where you are, but he loves you too much to leave you there. It's too long in title for our purposes, so we have shortened it to... God never leaves us where he meets us. Certainly true for our guest today, Vicki Smith. Hey there, Trapper. Hey there, Miss Vicki. What a ride, and she just keeps saying yes. Yes, and it's kind of like the rule of improv is yes and. Whatever somebody says, you just say yes and. And well, she just keeps getting these messages from heaven, and she goes yes and, and it keeps driving her deeper and deeper into her relationship with God. Hearing a voice leads her to a church, which leads to Magigoria in Bosnia. We've talked many times about the miraculous things that have been going on there since the early 1980s. Healing happened, huge healing happened over there. Encounters with saints have happened, just a yes and, <laughs> yes and. Who would think with how life began for Vicky with so much abuse, now things just keep getting better and better. Getting better all the time. You sound like a very friendly soul. Not me. No, not a chance. No, yeah. it's a bad rumor. I'm just, uh, I'm just the evil twin. You know. I got you. <laughs> That's funny. And I have so many stories. I just didn't know what to narrow it down to. Yeah. Could we go to Medjugorje? That's part of the conversion. I find it so interesting. I'll talk to people, and they're all in. I'll talk to people, and it's like, nah, a little too fringe. I'm going. I don't even know where the fringe is with everything yeah. that's happened over there. I don't hear the fringe. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah. I, maybe it's just people who don't know all the stories or the messages and how everything aligns and with Fatima and you know, all this kind of stuff. And I think the thing is, is they're operating from intellect and not wisdom. Yeah, because um, intellect follows a flow chart, but wisdom doesn't have to. Yeah, I think it's that's true. It's outside of that. I had re read Wayne Weibel's book. Um, you know who he is, yes? Uh, uh, what's yeah. what's the book title? Uh, Michigorie. <laughs> in fact, he's a Protestant, and the Blessed Virgin appeared to him in his living room and said, will you work for me? And he's like, well, uh, okay. <laughs> and so he did. And so he wrote about the um, apparitions occurring in 1981. All right, somehow, some way, I don't remember how, but this book, when I was seeking healing, this book landed in my hands. I read it and I was stirred, stirred in my spirit in such a profound way. I wanted to weep and I was praying for healing and I heard a woman's voice when I was just uh, beginning college. I find out later it's Mary and said, go to the Catholic church. Now I was praying for healing. I, I want healing and I hear go to the Catholic church. So I literally drove to a Catholic church, opened the door. I walk into the cavernous, empty Catholic church. I sit down in the pew and go, well, I'm here. And I knew that I knew that I knew I was supposed to be there, but I had nothing to, to grab onto with my physical hands. I did not know that Jesus was in the tabernacle to the right of me. And so I'd sit there and I'd, I'd ponder and I, I go, well, I guess I'll pray. And well, I guess I felt led to um, uh, Bambo and I just began to read the word because it felt like I was writing the divine current. This is what I need to do. Oh, that's All interesting. Right, you walked up to the Ambo and just started mm -hmm. flipping through the book. Yes, yes. And the different and readings on the different yes, days. Yes, oh. just I, I wow. had to. I was compelled to um, because you could say I was impelled by love. And this is what was going on with the healing. I'm praying for healing. I hear a woman's voice go to the Catholic church. So I go again and again, and I sit in this empty cavernous Catholic church. And I'm like, what? What do you want from me? What do you, what am I supposed to see? What am I supposed to hear? And, and then 
I was just led into where I must pray. I must pray. And I was uh, wondering about this rosary thing. And I just wanted to, I just wanted to hold it. It, I was like compelled, if you will. Well, the rosary is about Jesus. Amen. Amen. (laughs) And it's Mary leading us to Jesus and what Jesus did. I was compelled for spiritual food. Time after time I go there. And then I heard after I read the book, uh, Mitch Gray by uh, Wayne Weibel, you will go there. And I'm like, when? Well, it would be many years later. And we're stationed in Ramstein, Germany at the air base there. And um, I am desperate for healing. The, the migraines on and off, on and off, on and off. I am suffering now. Now I had migraines starting at the age of 12, but by time I get to Germany, I'm having them uh, three days on, four days off, three days on, four days off, three days on, four days off. No one can give me uh, something that will prevent it from happening. Um, and I had three boys at the time. My oldest had uh, autism. My next one, they thought he was on the autism spectrum as well. And I just had my toddler, uh, my third boy. I had my hands full. And this is also the time whenever uh, the World Trade Center was going to go down. As I'm having the the migraines on and off, on and off, on and off, um, I get now. And when I got now, Medjugorje was placed on my heart and I told my husband, Steve, I, I got to go now. I got to go to Medjugorje now. You you heard now and you knew what the now meant. Yes, because it was impressed upon me. And so I went loaded on medication because I was having yet another uh, migraine. Now, before I went, though, I picked up a book called A Man of Hope about Padre Pio. And so I read it. I really just was, again, I, I had to hold on to it. I was digesting it like real good spiritual food. He talked about uniting Christ's sufferings with yours. And so I thought I'm having migraines, might as well unite it to the crown of thorns. Simultaneously, Father Pio also said, I will take on spiritual children and escort them into heaven. At that moment, when I read that, I was like, I want him to be my spiritual father. I've got, I've got nothing to lose. I said out loud, Oh, Padre Pio, would you be my spiritual father? And right then my room filled up with a fragrance that wasn't there before. And, and I thought the natural thought, I must've changed my dryer sheets. So I changed changed my, I still ate pillows. No, they don't sell anything like it. I'm assuming flower kind of flower. Yes, it was floral. Yeah, because yes. his it's interesting, as you know, his bleeding hands when he'd wrap his hands and all that because he had the wounds of Christ and and they had the, the scent of flowers. It's just mm-hmm. yes. crazy. That guy, yes. that guy was amazing. Still is. Yes, yeah. yes. And so um, I go, this is my yes, isn't it? And then right then, once I got the kind of like exclamation point, yes, you've got it, the fragrance left. And so I was like, oh, my gosh, this is amazing. So I go to Medjugorje. We listen to the talk. But before we go in, I'm smelling roses. And I'm thinking, huh, they must be working the rose field here. I come out. I smell the roses again. Huh. I got to go find this rose garden. And I go and I look and there's no rose garden. And I find two little old ladies who are Irish by accent. And I said, excuse me, do you guys know where the rose garden is? And they look at me and they're like, that is no rose garden, darling. You've got a gift. Yes. And I'm like, well, I was smelling roses over there, but they're not there anymore. And they both smiled with this like knowing smile. I'm like, what does that mean? And so then I go to a bookstore and I start looking around and I have my eyes on a book about Padre Pio. And the rose scent begins to just fill up my environment. Again, I'm out, I'm on the blue cross now and I'm smelling roses right next to a man who's with me. I go, wow, do you smell those roses? And I'm, this is Mary. And he's, he goes, no, I don't smell any roses. He goes, I guess it's for you. And I'm like, okay, but what does it mean? And then I was led to a reading where it says to those, one of the visionaries wrote that whenever Mary touches you with that scent of roses, it means she wants to use you. That's not the only thing. I finished Holy Mass and one of the lady that I prayed over, she said, can I pray for you? And I said, okay. And so she put my hands together and on the back of my left hand, she made the sign of the cross three times. She said, while she made the sign of the cross, 
Padre Pio, Padre Pio, Padre Pio. And instantaneously, my ears, in, way, way deep, deep, deep into my ears, began burning with this a wonderful burn, not a burn, ouch, this is hot. This is a burn, this of liquid love. And I felt like I lifted up off the ground and came back down. And instantaneously, I thought, I bet those are my migraines. And they were. I was healed. Gone. Yes. Wow. After how long? How long had you been dealing with that? Oh, man. Well, the, the, the for the every three days, that was for over a year. But for migraines in general, that was since I was 12. Obviously, um, in Magigoria, the, the, the big healing was, was the migraines. But while you mm -hmm. were there, are you seeing the things that everyone talks about when they're in Magigoria? Other experiences as well? Yes. <laughs> and it's kind of interesting because when we were um, being driven uh, on the bus to Medjugorje, um, we were told, listen, yes, there is a miracle of the sun, but please don't stare at the sun. Uh, if, if it's meant for you, you'll know it, it, you'll experience it. If it's not meant for you, you can't force it to happen. So I get off the bus and I stare straight up <laughs> the sky and nothing's there nothing's happening it's a bright sun but later later i am traveling up to cross mountain i'm going by myself and i'm in prayer and uh, i look up and i can see and look directly at the sun and uh i it began to there was there was a gray circle inside and it began to rotate in, in, in a circular motion. But I, talk, I talked to the docent, our tour guide, and she, I said, look, this is what happened when I up there. And I saw this gray circle in there, and I sensed it was the Eucharist, but I didn't want to put any words on anything I had until it was getting kind of confirmed. And um, she says, you just saw the miracle of the sun. I go, oh, because some of my understanding was that the sun would pulsate, and things like that. Right, which so, it has done, obviously, right. and spun and all kinds of, and some people have described it as kind of a plate, in, almost like a plate, so you can stare at it, doesn't hurt. Yes, that's, uh, yeah, that's kind of a good ex example. You know, I, th you know I, think, I think God would do everybody, if it, it, see, we would know there was a miracle going on if, if he just did what the movies do, just add some music. See, yeah. now, if, if you're looking up and then you should get that, Whoa. Whoa. You know, yeah, exactly, then you go, oh, miracle, miracle. Let's pause right about here, then more with Vicki Smith and this ongoing, well, the message is God never leaves us where he meets us. We just have to say yes to that. And Vicki just keeps saying yes. Uh, while we're pausing, let's uh, thank uh, Natalia Okana. I hope is how that's pronounced, Natalia. Thank you so much for your help on Patreon. Uh, getting to know Natalia here uh, within the Patreon family. I hope to get to know you as well. She's one of those who said yes to supporting what we do here. If you'd like to do the same, you can come here to episode 174, and just click on through to Patreon or go to patreon.com and uh, just uh, search for Trapper Jack. And there we are. And thank you so much for your ongoing support and making all of this just keep going on and on. Thank you for that. Okay, now more with Vicki Smith. Hearing a voice leads her to a church, which leads to Magigoria. Who would think with how life began for Vicky with so much abuse? So growing up was really, really uh, very much a trial. And my father felt I was his property. And there is a lot of abusive situations that went on emotionally, sexually, physically, spiritually. His stepfather was his mom's sixth husband. My mom had her mom got married nine times. Together, they had 15 stepfathers. And so while we did have our uh, joy-filled times, um, it was not very often. And so my brother and I, he and I were constantly in fear, constantly struggling. Because of that, in the middle school years, I began to self-abuse. Um, so I was a cutter um, before the cutter was a word. Yeah. I find out later that my mom was a cutter. Oh, gee. My my dad has said, don't cry or give you something to cry about. And I actually stopped crying from then until into my um, mid thirties. These things aren't happening with you without forgiveness of father. <laughs> There's just no way. Uh -huh. uh, mm -hmm. Big, big you, hurdle. Yes. You would think that would be a absolute ginormous uh, hurdle that would just be just 
how could you do that? It happened. The forgiveness happened. Everything that I had, a heart murmur. The heart murmur that I'd had and struggled with. Oh, by the way, when I forgave my dad, my heart was completely healed. And it no longer shows up. Funny how that works, isn't it? The connection, Funny. the connection yes. between body and uh, and all that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the IBS and the IBS, more healing, more forgiveness, completely stopped. Yeah, nice. all that it was all healed. But the biggest for me, the biggest was was depression. The biggest one was depression because I met it every single day, and every single day I just thought about. I spent six years in bed, hiding. I would get my kids up for school. I'd pretend I have a normal life. I just couldn't wait to get back to bed and I'd sleep the day away, pick them up and try to make a lovely dinner and just couldn't wait to go back to bed again. Because sleeping was a time you weren't dealing with the pain? The, the depression pain, I will yeah, say. Yeah, this, yeah. The, 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 the oppression and depression carries a heaviness with it that is so difficult to, to describe. And we can cast that out in the mighty name of Jesus, in his authority by the name of Jesus, by his stripes be healed in the name of Jesus. And I was, I nice. was through grace. Grace is the superpower of heaven. Grace came upon me and began to reorder things. And as I told you uh, in one of the retreats that I went, an acts retreat, I had a healing of memories. So now I don't have that sting. Sometimes it's, it's the sting of the assault, emotional assault, physical assault, sexual assault. It's the sting of that assault that makes it very difficult to forgive, right? Um, but the stinger was removed. I have the memories, but I do not have the stinger. I do not have the pain. The Lord said, that which appears as an obstacle is now your stepping stone to victory. Nothing's too hard for Jesus. Nothing through his precious blood and through me giving my yes and amen, I was healed. I was taken out of bondage. Demons actually left. Beautiful. So many times talking to people that those who go through really challenging early years, God gives this incredible balance of blessings and gifts. I must say that has to be a, a firm yes. While I sometimes say, while my external world was failing me, my internal world was thriving. I was having conversations with our Lord. I learned the language, and it was my fluent language of despair, sadness, morose, malaise. However, I would be having these conversations on the side with God. Now, I didn't, I wasn't able to articulate it like this until much, much later, um, really only a few years ago. I would feel companionship when I felt so abandoned. This was supernatural. I, I, I didn't know then it was supernatural. I just felt it and experienced it. He said, love is the animating force of life. What was your picture having this conversation with God? How are you picturing God? I guess I pictured God not through a visual like you would see a picture of a person. The, it was a sense of presence. I just would go this knowing place, this place of... of embrace. Was he always there or was it just, you know, uh, you'd visit or you just always felt that there he was? Mm, good question. Because no, I did not feel he was always there. When I was in the throes of emotional turmoil, depression, sadness, wanting to end my own life, I did not feel he was there. When I say feel, I mean feel. Now mm -hmm. I knew he was there, but I didn't feel it. And um, I realized only later about what it means to be in spiritual warfare. Um, and the Lord really, as I look back, he shows me how he has made me approachable to others who've been in these kinds of situations. For example, when I gave my very first retreat, I thought it was going to be a very nice retreat on love and fear. And that was going to be it. And I showed it to a priest. And he says, well, this is very good and nice, but where's your testimony? And I'm like, oh, no, 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 <laughs> we can't tell my testimony. And uh, he said, well, then don't give the retreat. It's by the word of testimony, others receive healing. So the very first retreat I gave, I, I risked it. And I told just a little bit about what had gone on, including the hospitalization. And uh, someone came up to me afterwards and said, oh, my gosh, I, too, was hospitalized. I, too, was abused. And if he can do it for you, 
I know he can do it for me. So I saw how he was using me in this way. And he would, he would really edify me in so many other ways as well as my life went on. And so I went, I got my degree, Texas a and I got a, a teaching degree. And then I also went in on to get my master's in educational psychology. And the Lord gave me this message believe, <laughs> while I was showering. Oh, he works. He works really well in the shower. Are you kidding me? He does. I know. I get my best messages in the shower. And then I'm going. Where's my little recorder? I, I hey God, I don't have my recorder in here. I, I you know. know. <laughs> he said, "I'm going to heal you, and I'm going to convert you. You're not done yet." You felt that. Do, do you hear it? Do, is it? Is it words? Is it understanding? Is it knowing? Ah, yes. And so uh, a book that I'm writing right now is trying to explain how I hear. And how I understand when there is no voice. It's infused. There's an infusion there. Infused. It's intimated. It's understood. In in terms of phrasing, when I get a phrase like that, sometimes it's written out in front of my mind's eye. Um, and or I will see an image and these sorts of things, the way in which the Holy Spirit can speak to you as well. It was just incredible the way in which it happened. In an interesting way about, um, I was in invited to this uh, prayer group where there was a deacon who used to be a psychiatrist in my middle school. And he was there. He was healed of MS. The Lord healed him. And he said, I'm going to give up the worldly physician and hold on to the divine physician. And he became a deacon. He was there. He prayed over me. And what's very interesting is he, when he was praying over me, he leaned over and said, you're about to rest in the spirit. Just let it happen. And I looked at him with kind of a snarky voice and said, you've got the wrong girl. I never go down. Now, I say this because I had been to healing service after healing service, um, holy mass retreats, conferences, seeking healing. I was desperate for healing from depression. And I, it, it, people would go rest in the spirit. And it was like duck, duck, goose. I was the one that stood up and everybody else around me was it with great peace. I was like, ah, but But then all of a sudden, this warm honey comes over my head, down through my head, goes through my entire body, and I rest. I rest in the spirit. And it was that moment that I received another gift, uh, the gift of tongues. So I told the Lord, I want more of that. Where is that deacon? I want to go to where he is again. I want more prayer. Well, it was a setup by our Lord in a beautiful way. Because I found out that he's going to be praying over people, this deacon, on a Friday night. First, it was going to be Holy Mass. And so um, I went and he began to pray over me. And this happened to be July 4th, Independence Day, freedom. But it took a year for me because part of it was about educating me on what deliverance looked like because he is going to use me in this way for others as well. This part of your life that started with a voice, you didn't know who it was, this woman's voice, which leads you to a church, which leads you to Magigoria, which somewhere along the way you go, oh, that's Mary. And since you didn't mm-hmm. start with an understanding of Mary, uh, t- talk a little bit about w- what that road has meant. You didn't, you didn't come from that. Correct. When I found out, when I understood is what I should say, it's, it's more succinct when I say, when I understood it was her. Versus I found out that it was, no, this, this, no, I go back and it more succinctly saying, because it's about the embrace and, and, and you begin to know, and it's almost in where scripture says, arise, O sleeper, and where it says, let the scales fall from your eyes. These things that have been invisible to us, then we recognize in our spirit. And it was, it's more like a, yes. It's difficult to describe, except it's just this, yes, it's you. But this is what I asked before I went to Medjugorje. I said, now I heard Mary say, convert, convert, convert as her message. And so I said, okay, but she doesn't say convert what? Does she she want us to convert to Catholicism? Does she want us to convert our heart? Who has the answer to this? I said, Mary, if you want me to convert to Catholicism, give me a sign. And the moment I received the healing, that was my sign. And so I went through RCIA back at Ramstein, and I was a confirmed Catholic by April. And, you know, just about Mary using you, one time I was on a plane, I started smelling roses. I thought that's the oddest place to smell yeah. roses yeah. unless somebody's wearing it. Well, it turns out 
during my plane ride, I happened to be looking at a book called Thunder of Justice uh, by Maureen Flynn. And it has a lot of pictures of Eucharistic miracles and these sorts of things. The man next to me caught his eye. We started talking. I started talking to him about miracles. Well, one thing led to another. And as we're getting ready to land, I was talking to him about miracles. We were getting ready to land. He says, I want to tell you something. I said, okay. He said, I was going home to end my life. But because of our conversation here, I now have hope. God, God bless you. God bless now you. I know why I had the rose set. Mary was getting ready to use me. Yeah. I was on assignment. It's interesting because Bishop Robert Barron has often said, uh, it's, it's obvious biblically, and it's, it's obvious with your story as well, is that when you have an encounter, it is always followed by a mission. You know, I never thought mm -hmm. about that before, that people don't just have these experiences and have a nice day. No, it's God getting your attention, shooting off the flare gun. Now let's go do something, <laughs> you know? Mm -hmm. And exactly. uh, that certainly has been your case as well. You had the encounter, you've had the Mary, you've had the, the flowers. It's I, I get to experience a lot of these directions as well. Um, and that's what's a beautiful thing. Um, and I'm trying to write about them. I'm also writing about the messages that I've received for the last 20 years. And I actually go see the bishop tomorrow. Ah, good for you. Good luck with the bishop. And I, and I know you mentioned in your notes that you actually had as a spiritual director for a number of years, a, a Catholic bishop. I don't know how you get there uh, for you. I know you had a priest and then what, what happened from there? I found this amazing priest. They have a mall ministry. He had to leave though. And he said, let me see if I can set up a, um, another spiritual director for you, for you. Now he did not tell me it was going to be Bishop Hannafin. He simply said another spiritual director. And uh, so um, apparently he talked to the, him and then it was supposed to all was going to be well. Well, um, so I write to Bishop Hannafin going, wow, it's pretty great that I get to have you as my spiritual director. He's kind of like, what are you talking about? I'm like, pardon. <laughs> and uh, he says, uh, you know, Vicki, I don't know who you are, and I don't have time to have another uh, spiritual directee. It's it's not going to work out. Okay, so on my on my birthday, Jesus uh, woke me up day and said, "I have a gift for you." I'm like, okay, go to the Holy Mass at the Citadel Mall. Well, that is a very strange request, um, but I followed. Guess who was there? Bishop Emeritus Hannafin. And what is even more interesting is he has never gone there before then and has never gone there since then. Jesus set the whole thing up. And you walked up and said, it's me, the one you won't be spiritual director for? I did. I said, hey, this is what happened today. And he goes, you know what? I think we can work it out. And he's been my spiritual director for the last 10 years. Wow. That's Is a that big, cool? that's a, and now how did Jesus wake you up and say all those words and how did you hear all that stuff? Cause everyone yeah. wants to know, it's like, I get nudges and I get, and I get phrases sometimes as I awake, often as I'm waking up, I'll hear a phrase or a song that spiritualized mm -hmm. means something, but he's, he's doing, uh, he's doing paragraphs with you. So how did he do that? Wow. I know it's that voice that isn't heard and but it's heard and all that it's, stuff again. Exactly. It's yeah. the it's the voice that has no sound. It's the voice within the silence. And that's scriptural because he said I will come to you in the silence. Um it is understood by me when I ask for a word on how to explain how it's understood by me. The Holy Spirit gave me the word intimated. It is intimated to me, almost like sewn in, and I'm noticing what is sewn in. So I don't know what your world looks like, Trapper, with not being able to see things, but you conceptualize things and group things and chunk things and categorize things with the way in which you hear them and sense them. Right, and I used to be able to see much better than I do now, so I certainly have a memory too, yeah. Okay, okay, so the Lord... Uh, the best way I understand it is he taps into those memories of words, I'm guessing. And they they there's a creative voice that speaks into my heart, and I understand what he's saying. That's the very best I can explain it. Okay. 
You've been you, you've been writing everything down. You've been writing down all your experiences, yes. messages, everything. Yes, mm-hmm. yes, in, including cataloging the year of deliverance, and that's going to become a book as well. Okay, but uh, the messages are. Uh, hunkered in to my uh, 30 to 40 journals and uh, I've now got them out. And the, the, it's always the core is love, but even his correction, can I just tell you Trapper, even his correction is met with such mercy and compassion when I understand it within me. And for example, my son, he, my son was a bit of a challenge when he was younger, my youngest one. And I was so frustrated with him. He was around six or so. And, and I was just really berating him. Uh, and just how, why do you always do, why do you, can't you just, and then I heard the voice with no sound mm-hmm. and said, how long are you going to make him pay? And I was, oh, stopped in my tracks. Wow. And then he said, how long should I make you pay for your constant disobedience? Wow. He said it in such a way, though, that had just... This, yeah. This See, and love. I just asked a priest this. I said, why is it? I said, one of the great not given homilies is on, is on discipline. Mm-hmm. Uh, it, you just don't, you don't hear anybody say it. And well, it's kind of difficult. And I said, I don't know. It's all over the Bible. People are doing, heck Moses couldn't even go into the promised land because he, he didn't speak to a rock. He hit the rock. You know, I mean, I said, yes. it's, it's all, it's all over the place. The disciplines are all over. I, 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 when I give talks, I talk about my disciplines, you know, things I've done. I mean, if I don't mm-hmm. say exactly maybe what I did wrong, cause I, I don't want to disclose, but I will say what, what it links to and how I got hit over here. You just, it, it's usually pretty obvious. He's not a mean God, but you can yeah. draw the line between when I did this right afterwards, I got that. And he gave me. I call them my spiritual spankings. Oh, and absolutely. <laughs> and then once you once you realize what's going on, and as a Catholic, I, I head into the confessional immediately. The blessing spigot is turned on double. I mean, it's just uh-huh. wow. It it is yeah. so night and day. It is so cause and effect. And I and I I I always tell people that. What a shame that people don't realize the blessings they could have if they would just get over their fears and go into the confessional. This is so true. I can't wait to get to the confessional. I mean, I just can't wait because I also in Medjugorje had a, uh, what I guess was called a Medjugorje confession, but I didn't know that. Uh, You know how they have, they have like 30 confessionals and this one speaks English. This one speaks Italian and French. This one speaks, you know, Mm -hmm. and then you see the priest in the various areas. Well, every time I saw somebody, I was getting in confessional line, every time I time I heard somebody walk by, they go, oh, that priest has gifts and that. Da-da. I go, oh, I change lines. And then somebody would walk by and go, that priest has this gift. I go, oh, I change lines again. And I thought after four lane changes, I'm like, I'm done. Okay. Look, Lord, yeah. <laughs> you know, you know, the priest I need. And so I said, I'm sticking here. And I, I walk into the confessional. It's my turn. And out walks the priest that was in there and in walks another priest. And this priest looked like soaking wet. He weighed 90 pounds, four hairs on his little bald head and glasses that were a little bit shifted to the right. And I look at the Lord up in heaven. I go, really? That's my human weakness to look at him like this. What I did not have on point is the gift he has in the office of priesthood. He carries an anointing with him. He carries it because he's a priest. And these priests, despite their human frailties, are full of power and authority because I've seen it. I've seen them make the command. I've experienced myself when I went through deliverance. And there is this a weight And that was coming out of my mouth and I began weeping and weeping. And now you got to remember, I'm not a big crier. So this weeping thing, I mean, I was just, wow, wiping my, my nose with my forearm and he's pulling out, bless his little heart, a crinkly little neckerchief and he hands it to me because there's no Kleenexes in the confessional. I'm like, thank you, but I'm good. And so in within that confession, though, I had mentioned a little bit about being judgmental about what's this healing business that I do? Why is one person healed here and not another one here? And so I'm, I'm confessing judge, being judgmental. 
then he stops after he gives me absolution and says, could you please pray over me? Now I know why I'm in that confessional with that priest. He says, I'm not a very good priest. I don't have faith like I should. I don't pray like I should. Would you please pray over me? I was astounded. I prayed over him. And a year later, I'm watching AWTN. He's talking about the gifts of the Holy Catholic Church, what they have to offer. (laughs) Well, well, I think he had a good year. Yes, I think he did. (laughs) Encounter, obviously, again, leads to mission. So this has all led you into a new world, your ministry, Mm -hmm. your work. So when, when... Someone and where's the best place to find you online? What's your what's your website? Ah, um, my website is www.inonespirit.com. All the words are spelled out: I N O N E S P I R I T. But I also have several YouTube channels, and uh, one that I do it is called Your Daily Dose of Spiritual Oxygen, Vicky Smith. So if you go to YouTube and type all that in, you're going to find me, and what I, that is a two to five minute teaching where I share what's going on in my life, but from the perspective of uh, looking to the Holy Spirit on what he wants to say about the matter or looking at what's actually taught about the matter. He's the one who gives us the discernment. The Holy Spirit is the one who has the wisdom and he gives us the information uh, to move with the ways of heaven. And so I work to cooperate and collaborate with the Holy Spirit as best as I can, understanding the way in which he speaks to my own heart. And I teach others to do the same by following the spiritual breadcrumbs, if you will. Uh, what's our takeaway today, uh, Ms. Vicki? What's the t- I mean, we talked about a lot of things. We've talked about Magigoria, and we talked about Mary, and we've talked about Padre Pio, and we've talked about yes. uh, in one spirit.com and all the yes. other affiliated. And I mean, there's just a lot of a lot of things going on here. But what's what's our takeaway? At its very core, it's love. It's knowing that we're never, ever alone. Never. And if you think you're alone, that's a lie of the enemy. The takeaways are never, ever alone. The maxim the Lord gave me was. Were I to stop thinking of you, even for a moment, you would cease to exist. He's thinking about you, Trapper. He's thinking about the listeners right this very moment. And I just invite them to invite him into the heart and do what love requires in each moment. To live faithfully one moment at a time. And if you didn't do okay in that last moment, it's okay. The Lord is mercy. He told St. Faustina, I am all mercy. Let the souls come and I will give them mercy. And just come. Trust in the mercy. So live faithfully one moment at a time. If you miss it, trust in the mercy and then recenter, recharge, and then again, do what love requires in that moment. Thank you. You're most welcome. Thanks, Vicki. Nice message to leave with. He never does leave us alone. In fact, we could have cut our title in half now that I think about it. Instead of God never leaves us where he meets us, just God never leaves us. Period. All right. So uh, thank you for, hey, you never left us during the entire episode. Don't leave yet. Don't leave, don't leave yet. Because I want to know what your message is, what your story is. Divine intervention, near death experience, angel story. What's yours? Get a hold of me here at touchedbyheaven.net. Thanks for keeping us a five star podcast in your podcast app by your ratings and reviews. And thanks for your help on Patreon at patreon.com. Either go to 174 this episode or patreon.com and search for Trapper Jack. Thank you so much. See you next week with another episode of Touched by Heaven, Everyday Encounters with God. I'm Trapper Jack.